thank you for everyone attending today. Um, so yes, I want to present the uh, the main findings of the report. I'm going to um, go through in roughly in order of the report in terms of the, the key sections. Um, what I'd like to say, I think, in, in a sense, is that whilst we're looking at the past, we're looking at 20 years of expenditures, um, for us, I think what was really important is what this points to the future, and especially what this means for the future of disaster risk reduction, the role of the international community, the way we spend money, where we spend money. And that became increasingly evident as we were telling the story of the past, that we, what we really wanted to do was look to the future and perhaps ask questions of, of ways in which um, the way we do things currently need to be improved. And that maybe that's one thing just to kind of remember as we tell a sort of uh, a story of, of 20 years. So let me just go straight then into it, um, talk a little bit about the introduction, the importance of the moment. There's just three sort of um, images here, and I'd like us to remember as we go through the rest of the sort of the data. The first one, which you would have known uh, if you've looked at the report, is the sort of the entry graphic. And I'd like us to focus our attention, in a sense, um, on the big picture. Um, $13.5 billion of disaster risk reduction from the international community from 1991 to 2010. I um, don't want to uh, talk too much about the donors, but really want to focus on where it goes, which is these four blocks to the right. don't want you to look at this in too much detail at this point, except maybe w a couple of things to point out. Where it says countries in that second block, we can see a heavy concentration within a few recipient countries right there, about 50% going to the top 10, for example. Within mortality risk, we see what seems to be a good sign, which is a lot of money going to uh, extreme risk countries, the bottom green graphic there. Perhaps something a little bit more worrying, those countries which are uh, particularly affected by drought, which um, if you look a bit more carefully, you'd see that those are those top three bars. And then finally, the amount of money which goes depending on the government capacity on the right side. Now, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail uh, as we go through the report, but that's kind of um, some of the key, key uh, data and information. Um, Secondly, of course, well, why is this important? Well, this is the impact of disasters broken down by uh, income class. So here we have a uh, number of disasters, financial loss and deaths. So perhaps not surprisingly, in terms of high income countries, we here uh, have a high, much higher figure in terms of financial loss, very few deaths. And we have the opposite picture in terms of low income countries, um, a high amount of um, deaths, little financial loss. But if you compare it to the 9% of number of disasters, you can see that that's particularly high impact relatively. And also maybe the lower middle income countries will also consider um, because that, um, as the global assessment report um, done by U US UNISDR tells us, that's where the risk is largely growing with uh, increasing exposure. So that's the second thing, just to, if you like, to consider as we go through the report, why is this important? And then thirdly, well, um, just a couple of small points, I guess, but they're actually large points, which Tom has alluded to. Firstly, of course, 2015 agenda, um, the successor to the MDGs, the SDGs, the successor to the HFA, the Hyogo Framework Agreement for uh, Disaster Reduction, and of course, climate negotiations. It's a p pretty important year. And then secondly, what we po possibly could say is um, at least present pressure on donor financing. We know that um, the OECD DAC donors have, um, in two consecutive years, reduced um, overall uh, expenditure, uh, development expenditure, and it's l not likely to increase greatly in the next few years. Um, but this is in part leading to an increased focus on, on either resilience or, or, or on risk. So that's a sort of third thing just to remember. Then going into sort of the, the analysis of the report, and this first section is talking about um, if you like the context uh, of disaster reduction in terms of in, in terms of how it's situated in terms of overall aid and the sort of the broad trends let's just focus our attention here first so this is disaster reduction apologize for the rather blurred image but there's 13.5 billion I'll ask the question here drr as a priority um, well let's just widen that out a little bit well that 13.5 billion in comparison to other disaster expenditure it's less it's only 12.7 percent of the total actually nearly double the amount is spent on reconstruction and rehabilitation. And uh, I think about more than four times the amount is spent on emergency response. So actually in terms of disaster expenditure, we spend nearly nine out of every $10 after the crisis, not the first crisis, uh, not before. But actually this is a, a small amount when we think of our overall expenditures on aid, on development aid, $3.3 trillion, $3.03 trillion 
over um, 20 years, and then you have the small $106 billion spent on disasters in the top corner. So despite, if you like, all of the press that uh, disasters can get, especially the large sudden onset disasters, um, actually in terms of overall spending, what it te seems to generate, if you like, or, or disaster expenditure is actually rather small. Let me move on to the next point. What about um, disaster risk reduction in relation to other kinds of expenditures, uh, other investments, perhaps we could say, from the international community? Um, well, there we have uh, some other expenditures. This is, this is just 2010, which um, for DRR was 1.1 billion. It's one of the highest years on record, I think the second highest. But in terms of what was spent on other kinds of things the same year, peacekeeping, 9.5 billion, food aid, 4.2 billion, and then the Global Fund uh, for malaria, TB, and AIDS, 2.6 billion. So you can see, just to get an idea of comparative amounts of money being spent on, on, on risk reduction. Largely skewed to after crisis, as I mentioned before, nine out of every ten dollars of disaster expenditure is spent after the crisis has already hit. Let's just take two particular examples here. We have the Kashmir earthquake, the Indian Ocean tsunami. They both occurred in 2005, of course, and perhaps they were perhaps a watermark if, uh, or a, a particularly important point for raising consciousness of, of, of the impact and disaster. And, and of course, they came in the, in the year also the HFA was, in, uh, was widely endorsed. Um, so in that year, for example, um, the amount of money spent after those two disasters uh, in total, response and reconstruction, is $3.2 billion. So basically we're saying that those two disasters alone, res the post-crisis amount of money spent, is equivalent to the quarter of the total amount spent on DRR to all countries in 20 years. So those two, two, two particular disasters alone just sort of show, if you like, how financing tends to be skewed to after crisis. And there's a lot of other countries and other data you could look at for that. But let's look at, uh, for a look at the overall trends in, in expenditure <coughs> of, of DRR over the 20 years. Um, so what we have here is the trend, sorry, 1991 running up to 2010. We're going to look a little bit first at the positive signs where we can see that uh, overall expenditure <coughs> it has increased. And there is, if you like, a stabilization <coughs> of the of expenditure of roughly 800 million to 1 billion between 2005 and 2010. I think that's a, that's a positive sign and you know we'd be looking at 2011 and 2012 data to see if that's held up. Um, one of the things though is, is quite important to note is that actually when you look beneath the data, a lot of the money in individual uh, uh, years is actually made up of large single projects to single countries. It's not generally, if you like, a wide trend of investment across a, a range of countries. Um, such as 2005, for example. And I think the second thing which I would uh, argue is also positive is that we appear to be moving, the international community appears to be moving away from expenditure in large infrastructure uh, programs, um, which is represented by the light green in this graph. You can see that that dominated, <laughs> accounted for a large part of the expenditure right the way up into <laughs> 2002. Um, and since then, it is, um, if you like, the remaining DRR, which, although it's difficult because of the nature of the data, it's much more about technical support, early warning, uh, lighter infrastructure, technical capacity, technical, uh, technology transfer, if you like, from then, which has come to account for the larger expenditure. Um, so that's just looking, if you like, at the overall and perhaps improving trends. Let's look at the... Um, the major recipients of DRR. I won't ask you to look at this in too much detail. I just said here, significant concentration. You don't quite see that on, on, the, on, the, on the image there. But I think we can see very clearly that left bar, which is the solid green, uh, the dark green, is DRR. And it's ranked by the top recipients running all the way down. Um, you have China there, for example, um, more than uh, close to 1.5 billion, running all the way down to Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, about $22 million. So you can see, there's a, as I mentioned right at the beginning, there's a, there's a big concentration in largely middle-income uh, countries uh, of, of total um, DRR. And that tends to, if you like, mask uh, certain inequality. Low financing to other countries. So it's just another way of representing the same data. So there you have China and Indonesia, $3 billion, those <laughs> two countries alone, 22%. So two out of every $10. Let's take the top 10, so China and India plus the white. Then we're talking about 
58% of total um, DRR to the top 10 recipients. If we add the next 20, then we're basically talking uh, something like 85% of all disaster risk reduction uh, has gone to 30 countries alone, and that leaves the remaining 113 countries sharing just over a billion dollars of, of uh, DRR, which I think is something to be uh, examined in more detail. So that's the overall trends. Uh, that's giving us a broad picture in terms of uh, where money is going overall. But we need to get to, of course, to a little bit more detail and actually un uh, understand and perhaps question why it's going to certain places or what could be the justification for this. And that's what this section of the report is looking at, which is disaster risk reduction in the context of need. So let's look at two um, particularly uh, important graphs within the report. They're within the report, they're shown on opposite sides of the of the uh, of the page, so you can see them in, in uh, perspective. So this is um, a selection, 51 countries basically uh, selected to sort of represent different income classes and to represent um, different risk levels to give a, a picture of how aid uh, uh, is spent in particular or finance in particular different uh, contexts. Um, so basically this is ranked by the multiple uh, mortality risk index uh, done by UNSDR. Um, and you can see um, that at the top, the Bangladesh, Myanmar, India, China, the, et cetera, those are ranked nine. All the way down to the bottom, we have uh, Palis uh, Palestine occupied territories there ranked two, Jordan ranked three. So it's running top to bottom. We would hope most of the money would go towards the top, looking in terms of this. And in general, there is there is signs that is the case. Um, all of the countries ranked nine have received significant amounts, perhaps except Myanmar. Myanmar, um, perhaps a special case in terms of the challenges of doing a, a development uh, in the past. Perhaps that will, that will uh, improve uh, now. But once you look beyond rank nine, then you perhaps ha start to ask questions about the um, priority in terms of financing to different countries. You see, for example, there's a there's a, there's a bunch of countries ranked five and six, which actually have quite large amounts of money being spent. So I've got Mexico, Argentina, Sri Lanka, and Brazil, for example. And then there's a range, a wide range of countries which are ranked higher in terms of risk, um, which have received very little at all. Um, Papua New Guinea, Haiti, Uganda, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, and Chile, just for within six. Um, and there's a series of in in what we might argue is inequities within this overall volume. I've just picked out Afghanistan, um, just for a moment to look at, in terms of comparisons of how money is spent or not spent on certain things. Afghanistan ranked eight in terms of mortality risk, so it's right up there um, as one of the um, more hazardous countries. Total DRR expenditure over 20 years, 22.1 million. The amount that just the DAC donors spent in 2010 alone, $6 billion. So just to give you a perspective in terms of how different uh, volumes of money are spent on different kinds of things, in uh, particular countries. Let's move on and look at per capita, where I think you have uh, particularly more problems if you want to use this as a way of challenging the equity of international financing. Um, let's just look right at the bottom there. We see Lebanon ranked four. We could argue probably possibly that's an outlier because it's just one country. Um, nearly $70 uh, per capita over 20 years. Um, but then when we get below that, we see that there's a lots of issues in terms of how uh, there's a mismatch in terms of money is spent. We would again want to see more money being spent um, uh, towards the top of the chart and less towards the bottom. We don't see that at all. We see much, much less, uh, if you like, um, relation between per capita expenditure and, and risk. I would pick out just Ecuador, for example, which is the second highest overall, nearly $20. Uh, that's actually 600 times more than DRC has received over the period in per capita. It's also, I think, 19 times more than Afghanistan has received. So just again, to, to show you that there does seem to be significant inequities in terms of the way money is spent. Let's look at drought for a moment. The multiple mortality risk of UNSDR does not include drought. So obviously that's important because drought is uh, of significant impact in some countries. So we put that out specifically to look at, because that would push up in terms of overall risk a certain amount of countries within that, within that scale that I just showed you. So here we have basically the top 10 countries um, of those countries which are 
basically ranks by the percentage of the population uh, annually affected by drought. And so if you look at the top two countries, Malawi and Niger, so basically on average, over 20 years, each and every year, 8% of the population is affected by drought, which is a massive figure. It really is a massive figure and cannot be underestimated in terms of I its impact on those countries. And we can see all of those countries are 5% are and higher, Lesotho, Mauritania, Zimbabwe, Djibouti, etc. So that mortality risk there, it's quite interesting, they're all ranked fi 5 and 4. But actually, if you added drought, maybe they would all more likely to be 7 or 8, if you had that you know, figure, if you could work that out. Let, but let's look at the amount of money which is being spent on them. Actually, only one country has had more than $100 million spent on disaster risk reduction. That's Kenya. All the rest have had less than $20 million. So, for example, Niger, and it's good that Mohamedou is here, so we can talk about Niger a little bit later, is the second highest out of these two countries, $19.86 million. That wouldn't even be on the top 50 countries, top 50 recipients that I showed you, that first graph showing where the money goes. So um, it is, uh, if you like, one of those missing links um, in disaster reduction, I would argue. Um, let's just move on to uh, a range of different risks. I'm not going to look at this in too much detail, except pick out one fact. What I mentioned here is the importance of drought, and then in rural agricultural-based economies. Now, basically what this is here, we're showing on the left-hand scale, percentage of GDP at risk, economy at risk of... Uh, of disaster, and then across the bottom, we have the percentage of population at risk. We would hope that the bulk of expenditure would be t towards the top right, right quadrants, the higher up the risk of both, we would see bigger circles. The circle represents the per capita um, disaster reduction, so we'd hope to see bigger circles. Um, we get a lot of mismatch in terms of where uh, different countries are represented. There's Ecuador, for example, right up there towards the top right not hugely up in terms of both risk, but a, a big amount of money, close to $20. We have Republic of Congo, which seems to be a rather odd choice down there, at $16. Uh, $16. And there's lots of issues, I think, when you look at individual countries. I just want to focus to this range of countries uh, across the bottom of, uh, in terms of GDP at risk, 30% running right the way across the bottom. So low economy at risk and high population at risk very little money. Nepal, Malawi, Niger, Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, Benin, all less than two dollars per capita. Significantly less. So population doesn't at risk, does not seem to drive uh, financing for DRR. Now the question, what countries should be supported? We spent a long time in the report trying to get to grips with find a, a useful proxy for um, government capacity of, of actually undertaking disaster reduction. So we came down on using uh, basically a measure looking at government revenues as a perhaps crude but useful measure of saying uh, what countries uh, need support from the international community. So basically these are the uh, all the low income countries that we were analyzed that we have data for and they're ranked by the government revenues per capita on average each year. If you want to know why there's a minus figure, it's because we've included um, those countries which are heavily debt, uh, sorry, ODA dependent, development aid uh, dependent. So we've, we've minus those from the figures. So you can see basically we have Liberia <coughs> at the top running to Mali. What's particularly important about this is, well, first of all, the slightly um, bold uh, countries in terms of the, the, the green bar, Burundi, Ethiopia, Niger, Eritrea, Zimbabwe, Burkina Faso, etc. Those are ones which we, we consider to be severely affected by drought. Again, so they're all low-income countries, drought-affected countries. Let's look, though, across the right to, to the total amount of money being spent in these countries. We can see that it's very little. In fact, the only country that received, m of low-income countries that received more than $100 million over 20 years in DRR is Bangladesh, which you can argue is a particular case, $900 million. Um, uh, so rather, all, every other single country received less than 100 million, and actually Haiti, which is up there in 99, again is an odd case because everything below that received 50 million. So here we have a range of, um, we could sort of go on a, a chronology if you like, so drought affected, largely sub-Saharan African, low income countries, so arguably low capacity to undertake their own disaster reduction, receiving very little support from the, from the international community over 20 years. 
just want to pick out very quickly two recipient countries uh, in particular, <coughs> pick out Haiti and then Niger, and talk about how money is sequenced. Um, so the white line is the number of people affected, and the green bar is the volume of money spent on disaster reduction. So we see um, storms, uh, even drought in Haiti back in 1992. Uh, we probably wouldn't be surprised to see storms and flooding in 2004 and 2008. Um, and then, of course, the earthquake in 2010 with a particular massive impact. But it's interesting to note that the 99 million spent in Haiti, um, very little of it was spent uh, on, on, on earthquake uh, prevention of any kind, as if the risks were not known. Um, and none was spent before 2010. And also not a lot of money spent uh, uh, in relation to the, the flooding and to the uh, tropical storm threat either. Um, but I think actually the next um, country is particularly relevant, which is Niger, even more relevant. Well, first of all, as I mentioned, it's less than 20 million over 20 years. So it's very little money. That's why this bar on the left, dollars, million, only goes up to six. That's the maximum amount spent in 2010. Three droughts, three major droughts in the 10 years from 2001 to 2010, 17 million people affected, and yet only 20 million spent on DRR. So, and if you looked at individual countries, it is, uh, you know, you really can see lots of interesting individual pictures. And then finally, conclusions and the way ahead. I do want to focus on the positives because I do think there are positives there for us to, to build upon, which are a foundation for the future. As I mentioned before, less on heavy infrastructure over the 20 years. We are slowly moving away from spending money in the richer of the middle-income countries, less money on China and Indonesia and others. Um, there is more stable DRR financing in the last four to five years, and we hope that will, uh, that will continue. Adaptation financing for DRR is on the increase, and I'll show one particular slide on that in a moment, and then national financing. And I'm just going to pick out on those last two because I think they are particularly important and positive. Let's look at adaptation, fi adaptation financing. Um, basically, before 2008, um, well, first of all, there's been a, a billion dollars spent on adaptation financing um, through the mechanisms that we're tracking um, between 2003 and 2011. Before 2008, none of them targeted DRR uh, at, all, uh, at all, not one. But since 2008, represented by that white bar on the right, uh, more and more projects uh, are actually focusing on DRR as the core and central activity, uh, so much so that actually um, close to a quarter <coughs> of all uh, adaptation financing is focusing on disaster risk reduction as a central activity. So that, I think, is a good sign. And with more money coming towards adaptation in the future, um, that hopefully will grow. The second point, I think, which is really important is uh, national financing of disaster risk reduction, which in some middle-income countries is substantial. So this is looking at just five of them, Indonesia, Philippines, Peru, Guatemala, and Panama. In the green bar is an average of certain different kinds of years that we had available of money being spent. So there we have Indonesia and Philippines spending $800, $900 million a year on disaster reduction. Let's compare that to an average year, yearly figure of the international community. Indonesia, $100 million, if you averaged out their 20-year total. Philippines, 50 million, uh, and so on. So we can see that there are a number of countries which are investing heavily in their own uh, financing. And then just a, f uh, a few summary points then, basically summing up what I've said so far. Uh, as I mentioned um, right at the beginning, DRR financing in itself is a fraction of overall aid. There's a heavy concentration of financing middle-income countries. Many high-risk countries have received <coughs> little DRR, and there's a lot of money being spent in response and reconstruction. Um, disaster losses in developing countries, um, a real bare minimum figure, about a third of, of development aid uh, in terms of volume. In the context of need, there is some correlation between risk and, and volume of financing, but there's very little between uh, risk and per capita. There's significant inequity. Financing, as I mentioned, and uh, the data tells us time and time again, financing in drought-affected countries in sub-Saharan African countries is particularly weak. Financing in general doesn't seem to take into account what would be government capacity to undertake risk reduction, and low-income countries have received, uh, in general, negligible international financing. So the way forward, more money, better money. I meant to put a question mark there rather than a full stop. So that's for the panel to answer, perhaps. So just some, <coughs> some things which I think are the data suggests us for, the f for uh, if you like, looking forward. 
Uh, one is we have to improve the data. There are issues with the data. But um, despite that, I think the pictures are very clear. We certainly need to question the role of the international financing uh, and the comparative advantage. Exactly what should the international community should be spending money on? What are the actual activities? What is the architecture financing? Do we have the best architecture in place? Perhaps Francis will <laughs> answer that appropriately. Um, how can we bring in financing uh, from elsewhere, from other kinds of places, which is not, say, so much uh, dependent on international uh, financing in those countries which need it? And then uh, particularly uh, moving forward towards effectiveness. Uh, and another thing which is rather important, which is integrating risk in all development, which, of course, is one of those key questions as well. Um, I would just like to fi finish on one final graph, if you like, which is to put those positives I mentioned into perspective. What we did here is just turn the data on its head and say, well, let's not rank <coughs> the countries by the amount of money spent on disaster reduction. Let's rank them by the amount of money spent on emergency response, <coughs> disaster response in this case. So this is the top 20. Um, Ethiopia, over 20 years, $5 billion spent, that lighter green, $5 billion spent on um, emergency response, a tiny fraction on the right, just represented by disaster reduction, and then all the other countries. So what's interesting, I think, about this is 17 of these top 20 recipients of disaster response have received less than 4% of all of their disaster financing in disaster risk reduction. Now, for me, that seems to be a picture which is perhaps rather odd and something that needs uh, to change. And uh, with that, I think I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. <coughs> uh, Francis, yeah. thank you, Jan. Uh, very, uh, very informative. I think lots of provocative data there for the panel to discuss and to provoke questions. Um, Francis, let me turn directly to you. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some interesting challenges in, in the conclusion there, questioning uh, some of the overall trends, the positives, and potentially some of the negatives. But from from the perspective of GFDRR as a as an organisation that supported this work and and of course is looking to the future and looking to 2015 and beyond, what would your reaction be and what would your kind of message be to the wider DRR community? 